Tonight we're going to begin the final letter of the tulip acrostic, that is the final aspect of reformed soteriology or Calvinism, that's the P in tulip, which can either refer to preservation of the saints or perseverance of the saints. I, d I definitely prefer preservation of the saints, you know, because it directs the emphasis to God's work of keeping us saved, which is the heart of that doctrine. But perseverance might be used more. Um, I tend to default to saying that unless I really think about it. Uh, that just focuses on the resultant blessing of what God does, which is cause us to persevere. That's also fine. They're both, they're both right. They're both accurate. It's just which part are you giving attention to? I think the plan is going to be, um, I still have more that I want to do. We're going we're to answer some objections to this next time. Uh, then I want to do a little bit on like history of this sort of thing and um, semi-Pelagianism and that sort of thing at the Council of Orange. Just give some backdrop about where this first cropped up in church history, where some of these debates first started and how the church sided with what we're teaching, honestly. Uh, I would like to do a little bit of history on Jacob Arminius himself. I would like to do a little bit on balance. And some of those can be crammed together and not spend a, a ton of time. But I don't know that we're going to do them back to back to back and continually, continually do that. So some of them might be stretched out. Parts, this is part 11. I think we're going to do at least 12, 13, maybe 14. But we can stretch those out into maybe March. And we'll get some of the gifted brethren back up here on Wednesday nights. Uh, so you're not hearing uh, from just me um, the same thing over and over. But we'll play that by ear. One thing we do want to recognize, this is a resultant doctrine, uh, meaning that it is the necessary result of everything that we've covered already. Like, it, it's at the end for a reason. It's because it is the result that God does all of salvation. That's, that's the idea, from getting to end, and we're saying he sees it through. He grants it to us, and he makes it happen. Of course, he uses means to do that. He uses means for all of this, and the same is true of the endurance of the faith. He uses means to call us to faith, and he uses means to keep us in the faith. So we're not, doing, we're not saying this is just like some magic thing that happens and, and there's nothing that keeps us in the faith itself. Uh, the church is vital to keeping us in the faith. All the means of grace are vital. Those are what are used. A Christian walk is not like a father that teaches his kid how to ride a bike. If you think how that happens, you know, they usually hold on to the handlebars and the seat, and they'll run with the kid. And then they'll let go of the handlebars, they're holding on to the seat, and then when you think they're balanced, you let go, and you just let them start riding. That's not the Christian walk. He doesn't just like, okay, you got it now, go, let's see if you fall. Everybody falls. <laughs> like, everybody wrecks, you know? It's not like that. He holds us up and runs with us, alongside us, the entire time. He keeps us from falling. He doesn't let go. So God doesn't just regenerate us and then, you know, send us out into the world on our own to either persevere from the faith or turn from the faith. Let's see how you do it. That's, that is not the idea of the Christian walk. He ensures that we keep the faith through means, of course, but he ensures we keep the faith so that all of his elect remain in the faith. We stay Christians. Once we've been made Christians, we stay Christians. There's plenty of passages that teach perseverance of the saints, and we're going to look at all those, but we do want to recognize that this teaching is a necessary, logical, and consistent outworking of everything that we've covered so far. It works together with them. Now, the funny thing about perseverance of the saints, see, I did that, preservation of the saints, uh, is that you're going to find many that are going to still affirm it while they deny all the grounding for it, and that's particularly present in the SBC. I'll just say that because there's a lot of that around here, and you'll find one-point Calvinists, or really four-point Arminians. They don't think you can leave, lose your salvation. It honestly doesn't make any sense. It does not make sense to say you can't lose your salvation if you're denying total depravity and election and limited atonement and irresistible grace. It fundamentally does not make sense. So there's a lot of people that hate Reformed teaching on man's ability, our denial, our man's inability, you know, our denial of free will. We affirm free agency, we deny free will. We don't say man is spiritually capable, and they don't like that. But they still affirm perseverance of the saints, and by doing so, they fundamentally teach that God removes the very free will that they argue for so adamantly when it comes to total depravity. It just doesn't make sense. It's wildly inconsistent. It really is. 
The fact is, if you deny all the other parts and on the other points of Calvinism, particularly unconditional election, you'll see that throughout all these verses, then you ought to affirm that Christians can lose their salvation. You should. If you deny all those other things, you should say, yeah, you can lose your salvation. You have free will to become a Christian. You have free will to stop being a Christian. You have free will to you know, take up faith and free will to put it back down. Another misunderstanding, or really a mischaracterization, if, uh, is we, we often face this, is the accusation of cheap grace. Cheap grace, which is not what perseverance of the saints is. That is not what we te- teach. Cheap grace is the idea that you can repent and you, you have faith at this moment in time, but then there's no change in your life. You can continue in sin and you live however you want because you got saved and you stay saved and it doesn't matter what you do because, whoop, too bad you got it. You can't be taken away. God's like, darn, and got another sinner in here. No, that's antinomianism. It's lawlessness. It's not what this idea or this doctrine supports. It doesn't, it's not a license to sin, which is what they accuse us of. This was the big thing in our Anabaptist church growing up. Uh, they, they never understood preservation of the saints for what it actually taught. Anabaptism is ultimately a pietistic holiness movement, so it senses a threat. If it senses a threat to holiness, then it reacts really strongly. And in this case, they straw man this doctrine and attack it. Now, a, a reaction against you know, a threat to holiness, that's actually a good thing, right? If we see something as a threat to holiness, we should react negatively against it. But doing so in ignorance is not okay. Uh, pretending someone is teaching something that they're not is not okay, and that's what they do. And these churches of Christ, actually, the, like the, the debate that we're having, one of the, the guys wants to do a debate on once saved, always saved, and I'm like, well, that's kind of a misnomer, and really that doesn't make sense to debate that with all this other resultant doc- It's a resultant doctrine we have to lay all this groundwork first, but they're very big on this because they reject justification by faith alone, and they strongly, strongly advocate for the teaching that a Christian can basically sin their way out of salvation. There's a lot of those in the South as well. It's generally those, those sects that uh, hold to works-based salvation, ultimately, that tend to be consistently Arminian enough to deny perseverance of the saints. If they're works-based, they're going to say, yeah, you can lose it. And that's, they, they really go hand in hand. And not all Anabaptists, but most Anabaptists have that tendency. It's, it's faith plus works, and Church of Christ literally outright says it. So they'll, they'll just, the, the, the second debate we're doing, they're denying justification by faith alone. So there you go. And that's why they're so strong on it. They all think that we teach cheap grace, that, that you know, we can just sin as much as we want and stay saved and it's too bad because you gave it to me, God, and now you can't take it away, and I'm going to do whatever I want. They completely misunderstand the teaching. That's not what we teach at all. We, as much as anyone, can look at someone's life and, and, and see their life of sin as clear evidence that they're not saved. Regardless of what their claim is, regardless of what they say they believe, we can say, well, your life doesn't testify to true faith. Therefore, I don't care what you say. Your life is your testimony, and it denies that you're saved. We can do that. Those that claim that they are Christians but don't live the Christian life, they don't walk the Christian walk, they're simply proving that they're not converted. And their claims are irrelevant if it doesn't match what they're, how they're living. So anyone that portrays this teaching as if that is what we advocate is exposing himself as completely ignorant. The fruit that we bear reveals our inward reality. If we do good works and we repent of our sins, then we're giving evidence that we are saved. We're not saved by our works. Giving as evidence doesn't save us or keep us saved. Doing those works don't keep us saved. We're not saved by faith plus works, but we're not saved without works either. No one is saved without works because all true faith produces works. Works simply reveal our inward nature. It shows us, are, is this person born again or not? If they're born again, they're going to produce good works and obedience and a life of following Christ and repenting whenever they fail. I know you know all these things. I, I know. Um, we just need to clarify them for our critics because they make these false accusations about what we actually teach. Now, even though this doctrine is a necessary result of all the previous doctrines of grace that we've covered, that doesn't mean that it, you know, it lacks biblical evidence on its own. We're not just saying, well, because these are true, this is therefore true. We're saying it's consistent with what we've proved is true, but it can certainly still be made clear just from the pages of Scripture. So now is that part 
where we saturate in the biblical evidence for it. And I, this is what we do every time. We believe this because the Bible says this, and we just start looking at the verses and showing how they are consistent. We don't believe that because it's consistent with the rest of Reformed theology. That's not why we believe perseverance of the saints. Of oh, oh, it just matches well with it. No, we believe it because this is made clear in God's own revelation. And then we see that it's consistent as well. And I might say this before we cite anything too. Preservation and assurance go hand in hand. It really ought to be, I mean, we're preserved and that is why we are assured. Because it does not rely on us, you know, keeping up with it or doing good enough and uh, our endurance personally, it's the endurance God works in us. So assurance and preservation go hand in hand. If the Bible is assuring us of our salvation, then it is because God will not fail to save us and keep us saved. So every time you see an apostle assuring the readers, he's doing it based on perseverance. That is why we are confident. That's why we have no fears. That's why it's, I mean, Nobody can look at themselves and be like, I know that I would never deny the faith. Of course not. I think I say this later, but I don't, mean, I, I, I don't think I, I don't know who I heard it from first. If we could fall, we would fall. Everybody knows that about themselves if they're honest. It's not because we could never possibly abandon the faith. Not I, not I. It's because God keeps his children. That's why. Because God doesn't lose his sheep. In fact, we'd even say, if we could fall away, we, we would. There it is. I knew I had it in here. And we see that in the very first verse that we're going to cite. So, 1 John 5.13, he says, These things I have written to you who believe, speaking to those with faith, in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. If we know it, then that confidence must be grounded in God's work and not our own. We don't boast in the flesh. We don't trust in the flesh. It is not ourselves. We persevere because God preserves if we know it, when he says that you know it, it's because God has done it and is going to keep it that way. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, I think we've cited this before. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. He does not take back his gifts and the calling. If he calls you out of sin and darkness and regenerates you, he doesn't unregenerate you. If he's granted you the gift of faith, he doesn't take it away. Faith is a gift. We've proven that thoroughly. Repentance is a gift. We've proven that thoroughly. Being called... Out of sin and darkness is a gift. We've proven that. So those are irrevocable. They don't, they don't get undone. 2 Timothy 4.18 The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. How can Paul say that? It's, he's, he's literally saying, I'm not going to be lost. Because who? The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. He will bring me safely into the heavenly kingdom. That's preservation. Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, or the author and finisher of our faith. My dad always finished his prayers growing up using that citation, and I heard it my whole life, so I'm very familiar with it. Perfecter here is not speaking of the idea of flawlessness, like he takes away every flaw of our faith. It's speaking of completeness. He begins it and he ends it. He's going to see it through. That's the idea. The author of your faith, he gives it as a gift, it comes from him, and he finishes it. He makes sure that it endures to the end. Our faith will be completed when we see Jesus face to face. He's going to complete it, and there it's done. When all the promises are realized and we no longer walk by faith and we walk by sight, by seeing Jesus face to face, seeing the new heavens and the earth, the thing that we've been promised, we're not trusting it to come. We'll see it. We don't need faith anymore. So our faith will be completed then in the new heavens and new earth. Philippians 1.6 for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Perfect it. Again, again same idea. He's going to complete it. He began it. Regeneration in faith. faith or regeneration precedes faith. He began that work in us. He does it. And he's going to complete it. He's not going to just, he's not going to just be like, all right, now you go and finish it. It's not the dad sending the kid on his bike that's got to wreck over and over and over until he gets the hang of it. No, he completes it. Jude 124, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Now that's a very common benediction, but who is it that keeps us from stumbling? Who is it that makes us stand blameless before his glory? God. It's talking about God. 
He is able to do that. And that's not just an empty promise like, hey, he's able to. Isn't that nice? He doesn't. He could. He's able, but he doesn't. No, he's saying that's what he does. He's able to, uh, he's able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand. And he's going to make you stand blamelessly. Jeremiah 32, 40. I will make an everlasting covenant with them with that I will not turn away from them. He's not turning away to do them good, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so they will not turn away from me. This is part of the new covenant. What he does to us, putting his fear into us, that's the kind of faith that we're granted. It's a faith that will not allow us to turn away from God. It's a working, enduring faith, and it is so we will not turn away. That's a promise of the new covenant. New covenant faith is a faith that doesn't fail. We won't turn away from God. I mean, I just don't know how people get around this. It's not a man-made faith that fails. It's one that is produced by the Holy Spirit in us. John 6, 39 through 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of that, of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, we see preservation of the saints is rooted in, in election and all those previous doctrines of grace because that's what Jesus is talking about in John 6. There's a group of people chosen by the Father, given to the Son. The Son's job is to take this group of people and save them. That's his job. And return them safely back to the Father. And the Son promises that none of them will be lost. There is this group. None of that group is going to be lost in between there. All of those given by the Father will look on the Son and believe in him, and all of them will be raised up on the last day. Each one of those is part of the promise. It's a, it's a chain of the same group gets each of those things. Hebrews 10, 14. For, a, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's more objective atonement language we talked about with limited atonement. If we are perfected, then guess what that means? We're perfected. Perfected means perfected. Perfected people stay in the faith. He's going to see that we are perfected. Matthew 18. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If he turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the other 99 that have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. Now, Obviously, we know about the sheep language, the sheep and the shepherd. Christ is a shepherd. He has a flock of sheep. That is the people given to him by the Father. There are sheep that he has promised to keep. And he's saying, if one of them is straying, because yes, we stray, bound to wander, as the hymn says, he's pointing out, I'm going to go get my sheep. I'm not going to lose my sheep because it's the will of the Father who is in heaven that not one of his little ones perish. No one is going to perish if they're one of Christ's sheep. It all makes sense when we realize this promise is made for Christ's sheep. Not for his goats, not for the goats. There are no, Christ doesn't have a herd of sheep and a herd of goats, and he's keeping some of the goats and all the sheep. No. It's not for the wolves in sheep's clothing, the fake people in the church. Christ will not lose any of those given to him by the Father. He's going to rescue his wandering sheep. Again, enormous blessing of the new covenant. He's going to go and get all of his. John 10, 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Same idea. Overwhelmingly obvious here, right? It's the same concept of Christ keeping his sheep. But we have the additional promise that no one's going to take them away either. The objection I hear from Anabaptists on this one, or Arminians, I should say, Anabaptists too, but Arminians, it's that, well, nobody can snatch you out of the hand, but, you know, we can jump out of his hand. <laughs> Literally, I've heard that. And of course, that pretty much renders Christ's encouraging promise here as null and void. Who's fearing someone coming and taking us out of the Father's hand? No, we're worried about us giving up the faith and failing. That's the idea. Last time I checked, we are all someone, and... Jesus said, no one is going to take us out of the Father's hand. So if we're someone, then we're included in the no one that's going to. That's my logic there. 
Satan is someone. Satan is someone as well. And he's not going to deceive any of the elect. He's not going to get us. He's not going to trick us. We're not going to fall for his deceitful schemes. We'll talk about that later because it's, it's one of the verses. So no one is making the claim that people go on believing and trusting Christ and repenting, but then, you know, someone is taking us, someone else is coming here and taking us out of Jesus' hands, and we're getting dragged away by someone else, and, and like, no, no, I want Christ, and you're taking me, and you're snatching me out of Christ's hand. No, the promise really says little if it doesn't include us, <laughs> you know, being prevented from taking ourselves out of Jesus' hands by believing some false doctrine or false worldly philosophy. Romans 8, 35, and 38 through 39. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there we go. Are we a created thing? No created thing can separate you from the love of Christ. I'm a created thing. Can I separate myself from the love of Christ? I cannot. Not according to Romans 8, I can't. No one is. Will worldly philosophies, false teachings, will they be able to separate us from the love of Christ? No. How about worldly temptations? No. Not because we never are tempted, but because regenerate people don't pursue those. The reason those things won't separate us from Christ is because he will preserve us from being separated by those things. And he'll use the means of grace to do that. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 through 9. So that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Confirming. We're already there. He's confirming it. Yep, that's one of mine. He's had faith his whole life. I see it. He's one of my sheep. He's confirming it. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's going to confirm us to the end, all the way. Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We're talking about the seal again. Guess what a seal does? It seals. The seal seals. The Holy Spirit himself is said to be the seal. He serves as our guarantee. That doesn't mean much if it's like, well, seals can be broken. I've also heard that language. Like, yeah, we're sealed, but seals are broken all the time. It's like, well, God's seals aren't pretty much the point of him saying it's a seal. That's the encouragement. That's why he says it's a guarantee. It's not like, I guarantee this as long as you don't break it. Don't screw it up. Faith plus works. The Holy Spirit is a gift to us. He's called it, I'm gifting you, granting you the Holy Spirit. And like Paul said in Romans 11, 29, the gifts of God are irrevocable. The Holy Spirit granted to us in our hearts is irrevocable. He is a gift, irrevocable. And the Spirit's not just, you know, it's not just there to make it visibly evident that we are sealed. You know, he works holiness in us. We produce that holiness. People see it, and you can see this person is saved. It's not just that. He serves as a guarantee. He actually does the work to make us stand firm in the faith. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. Now it is God, who is it? It's God who makes us, both us and you, to stand firm in Christ. Standing firm is that endurance language, perseverance language. God makes us stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. What good is a seal that doesn't guarantee you because it's so easily broken? It's all right there. God makes us stand firm. How does he do that? By anointing us. How does he anoint us? By setting his seal of ownership on us. What is his seal of ownership? His spirit in our hearts. What does the spirit do? He guarantees the eternal life to come. How does he guarantee it? By making us stand firm in Christ. How do we stand firm? By being anointed. How does he anoint us? By putting a seal of ownership. It's just a cycle. Yes. That's the whole point of it. (laughs) That's the whole point of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 24, 24. This one's important too. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. 
implying it's not possible. They're going to be so deceitful and tricky that if it were possible, they'd deceive the elect, but it's not. The elect do not fall for false teaching and false prophets and false Christs because they can't be deceived into believing a false gospel. They can't, they can't do it and then fall away from the faith in that way. People that claim to be Christian can certainly be deceived. People from the church are going to be deceived and they're going to fall away and most likely will. But the point is here that it's not possible for the elect to be deceived, not the ones that Christ gave, or the Father gave to the Son to be his sheep, that he says, I'm going to lose nothing, and no one's going to snatch them out of my hand. They're not going to be deceived. The false Christ and the false prophets are not going to snatch them out of Christ's hands by deceiving them. It's the same group. They can't be lost. It's for the elect. They're not going to be deceived. So someone's going to say, well, how do you even know that you're elect? You must not know. You know, there's people that pr proclaim Christ and they seem to be living holy lives and then they fall away. And how you thought they were elect, but they're not. Well, it's a good question. It's fine. Especially since Peter says, make your calling and election sure in 2 Peter 1.10. So A.W. Pink has got a, a good reply to that very question. He's kind of got a short list. How do I know that I'm elect? He says, first, by the word of God, having come in divine power to the soul so that my self-complacency is shattered and my self-righteousness is renounced. Second, by the Holy Spirit convicting me of my woeful, guilty, and lost condition. Three, third, by having had revealed to me the suitability and sufficiency of Christ to meet my desperate case and by divinely given faith causing me to lay hold of and rest upon him as my only hope. Fourth, by the marks of the new nature within me, a love for God, an appetite for spiritual things, a longing for holiness, a seeking after conformity to Christ. Fifth, by the resistance which the new nature makes to the old, causing me to hate sin and loathe myself for it. Sixth, by avoiding everything which is condemned by God's word and sincerely repenting and humbly confessing every transgression. Failure at this point will surely bring a dark cloud over our assurance, causing the spirit to withhold his witness. And seventh, by giving all diligence to cultivate the Christian graces and using all diligence to the end. Thus, the knowledge of election is cumulative. That's, I mean, that's describing the Christian walk. That's what we look for when, when someone proclaims, they come through these doors, say, I have saving faith. I want to join your church. I want to partake. Whatever it is, it's like, great. Those are the things that we list, look for. Not like, you know, down, down to the jot and tittle. But when they start describing their Christian walk, it's, well, I hate sin. I pursue righteousness. I want to be around the means of Christ. I want to be means of grace. I want to uh, be like Christ. I want to be with God's people. I want to, I love holiness. Like, the, not those exact words, but those things. This idea. That's what we're looking to see articulated. That's not cheap grace. That's not easy believism. There's no room for tolerating sin in a believer's life. Of, You're saved. Don't worry about that sinful habit of yours. No. God's preservation of the saints is not irrespective of our continuance in the faith. It's that our continuance in the faith is guaranteed because of his preservation. And one of the ways he does that is telling us to persevere in the faith. He tells us to turn from the sin and repent when you do it. That's the means that tells believers, ah, I sinned, I messed up, I got to repent, I got to return to Christ. That's what we do. Not that we are separated from him, that's just how we behave when sin comes into our lives. But it is God who sanctifies us and causes us to persevere. That's the biggest point. It's not irrespective of our continuance in the faith. It's that God causes us to continue in the faith. He promises to keep us. No one's going to take us out of Christ's hand. Nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. We see this in Ezekiel. We cited these with irresistible grace, but think about this. See how much this sounds like free will. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and a new, and a new spirit, put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. He will cause us to walk and observe and obey. Ezekiel 11, I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them and I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. The whole point is that he's doing it all. That he's not asking for it or we're not getting to some point of holiness where he's like, now you're good enough, now you're humble enough. Now you've made the right choices. No. If we're walking, if we are not walking in his statutes and carefully obeying his ordinances, it's not because we stopped believing. It's because we were never saved. 
Anyone that doesn't do those things, it's like, yeah, God has not put his spirit within you to do those things, to cause you to do it. We don't have his spirit within us as a seal and guarantee if we're not doing those things. If you're not doing those things, it's like, yeah, you're not, you're, there's no guarantee on you. We don't see the spirit on you. These verses show man's dependence on God to cause us to walk in his statutes and observe his ordinances. Our obedience, our holiness, our walking and observing is a product of God's grace. It is a product of God's grace. Not because we can claim it, not because we've been done good enough, not because we've worked really hard and kept the faith. It is a product of God's grace. Now, promoters of free will must be consistent and say that's a violation of God's free of, of our free will, man's free will. They have to say that if they're consistent. Because clearly God is explaining that his actions are the cause of our obedience. We can't switch back and forth from being regenerate. You can't just wake up one day and be like, I'm going to change my spiritual nature back to what it once was. And you can't be unadopted. Once you, like, my children can't cease to be my children. And an unadopted son can't cease to be an adopted son. You can't unadopt yourself or convince God to unadopt you. Can't be done. The Spirit himself bears witness that we are children of God. That's Romans 8.16. There are not justified saints that somehow fall through the cracks and they fall through, you know, out of Jesus' hands. All those that get justified get glorified. It's the same group. Why are they justified? Because they're given faith. Why were they given faith? Because they were regenerated. Why were they regenerated? Because he says he predestined them to be conformed to the image of Christ. Why did he predestine them to be conformed to the image of Christ? Because he said that he foreknew them. What does foreknow mean? It means he loved them before they were even made. So it's all based on God's love. And because he loves you, he's going to predestine you. Because he predestines you, he's going to regenerate you. Because he regenerates you, he's going to justify you. Because you're justified, you're going to be glorified. It's an unbroken chain. He does it beginning to end, author and the finisher. Anything else is dabbling with works-based salvation. It depends on God saving us, not us saving ourselves. And if you're, if you're tweaking it just a little bit, injecting something into it, even if you're saying, well, well God gave it to me, but I've got to keep it, that's still works-based salvation. If salvation depends on something we do, that's faith plus works, which is soundly condemned by Paul all over the New Testament. You know that. If we can sin our way out of salvation, then salvation would depend on something we do or don't do. That leaves room for our own boasting. We stayed saved because I kept the faith. I did it. He didn't do it for you. Who's doing it? Is it man or is it God? We stay saved because we freely chose not to do this or that. That's faith plus works. Now, we're not going to get too far into this, but I do want to address it briefly. None of this means that we don't recognize the reality of apostasy. We do. Now, I've heard Arminians cite to my face as if we were denying this ever happens. when We were, we were talking about preservation and how God does it, and the response was, well, I believe that a dog will return to its vomit and there's people that fall away. I'm like, what? how is that even part of the debate? Do you really not know what we're saying here? Yes, people apostatize. We get that. So let's make sure we realize what apostasy is and is not. Apostasy is when someone claiming to be a Christian permanently abandons the faith and returns to a life of sin. Someone that claims to be a Christian. They leave the church entirely. And they do so permanently. It's not just someone that's falling into sin and temptation. It's not just when someone struggles, possibly even for years, that happens, and they return to the faith God calls him back. He goes after that wandering sheep, leaves the 99 that are safe, goes and gets them. So it's not just some struggle or sin and temptation. Those might be signs of a coming apostasy or their danger of apostasy, but they're not apostasy themselves. What apostasy is not is a true regenerate believer ceasing to be one of God's sheep and becoming a goat once again somehow. They cannot switch back to being unregenerate. That's not what apostasy is. There are people that claim faith. And they may have even convince themselves to be a Christian. They think it. They're not like intentionally lying about it. They think they're a Christian, but they abandon the faith. And we know that for a fact. that Their, their faith was not spirit-wrought faith then. That's how we know it, because they abandoned the faith. 
There's all kinds of people that don't even fully recognize what the Christian faith is, but they take that name on themselves and they affirm it, and you see some of the stuff they put out or some of the stuff they say, and you're just like, this person doesn't even understand what the faith is. When someone does that, when they apostatize, it's like, yeah, that was man-made faith, a fake faith, a faith that will fail, a failing faith. And we know this for a fact because John literally says people that apostatize were never really saved. 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, they left the church, they apostatized because they were never really of us. For if they had been of us, he knows they're going to persevere. He says if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they're not really of us. So to show it, they're displaying it. Not because they ceased to be of us. They're showing they were never really of us. His wording here is so precise and only fits the Reformed theology model. Really. It's clear that John knew that those that were forsaking the faith were never saved to begin with. One of the purposes of them leaving is to show that to be the case. Notice what he says about they were, if, if they were truly saved, if they were truly regenerate believers, if they were really of us, they would have remained. He knows that true saving faith endures. That's why he can say they would have remained. Staying faithful to the end is a sure sign that we are truly elect, truly regenerate. Those who do not stay faithful or who continue to sin are just they're not doing anything more than revealing their true nature as unregenerate. We evangelize those people. I was raised in the church. I was a Christian for you know, 30 years, and then you know, I came to my senses. Like, no, you were never saved. You were part of the church, the visible church, but not the invisible church. You weren't really of us. You attended. You came. You attended the means of grace. You were never really of us. How do I know? How do I know? Because you went out from us. And people that go out from us don't do that if they're really of us. John doesn't say that they were, they were once really of us, but then they stopped being of us. He says they were never really of us. It's so crisp. I love it. It's so crisp. If you're ever challenged on the preservation of the saints, using the reality of apostasy, you know, like, well, people apostatize. Just repeat these words over and over. Just, they were never really of us. It's, just, it's over. The debate is over. There are church members that are part of the church, but they're only outwardly part of the church. We could even say the administration of the church but they're not of the substance of the church. You can use that language even, though it sounds Presbyterian with the covenants, but that's neither here nor there. But they're never really saved. And we know that because they would have remained. I'm just repeating myself. All right. So John speaks of a faith that endures. He, he speaks of a change that happens to us that doesn't get taken away, that is irrevocable, that doesn't come undone. He doesn't say they probably would have remained if they were really of us. They probably would have stuck around. No, he says they would have. But they left to demonstrate it, to prove it, to show to us all they were never really Christians. They claimed it for themselves. They professed Christ, but they're false professors. Man-made faith, this so-called faith that people claim for themselves when they're not believers, is not true saving faith. It's not the kind of faith that we say is saving faith. It's not spirit-wrought faith. It's, it was not given to them by the Spirit of God via regeneration. The Spirit of God is not sealing them. He has not granted them faith. Apostates are nothing more than fake Christians exposing the fact that they are fake. They're not real Christians losing their faith. They're fake Christians proving their faith is fake. And we see this happen in the New Testament era as well. 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20 says, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. And I've heard that, that verbiage, that terminology used, oh, they made shipwreck of their faith, they lost their salvation. And that's supposed evidence of Christians losing their salvation. He's talking about people in the church that proclaim faith and their, their faith makes shipwreck and they go off and they're out of the church and he hands them over to Satan. That's excommunication. He excommunicates people, apostates. That's what you do with apostates. But spirit-wrought faith cannot be shipwrecked. Only man-made faith can be shipwrecked. Spirit-wrought faith is enduring faith. It's invincible faith. Invincible faith. We recognize the fake faith of fake Christians. But that's not the kind of faith that saves. Because it's not from God. It is of man. It is from their flesh. 
Now, next time, we're going to cover a couple other passages that get brought up. For instance, Galatians 5, 4 talks about falling away from grace. We're going to talk about what that means. That's not contradictory to the preservation of the saints. And we're going to look at Hebrews 6, where it talks about falling away. Those that partake in the church and basically, he says, they fall away. We're going to talk about falling away because a lot of time that language is used to portray someone losing their salvation, and it's not. It's someone leaving the church, yes, or someone pursuing salvation by some other means, yes, but not losing an actual salvation that they have. Okay, I, I figured this one didn't take a whole lot of convincing. Almost everybody believes this one before they're even reformed, um, for the most part. Not us. This is one of my biggest roadblocks. Was <laughs> I remember I was riding... Uh, we had thir- when I was at Purdue, we had Thursday night um, services with all the, um, it wasn't Wednesday, it was Thursday for some reason because of the college kids, and the co- it was a college church. And um, the guy that I was riding to church with was, I think it was MacArthur or somebody else, and they were talking about how, you know, you can't lose your salvation because faith endures, and I was steaming, sitting in the shotgun, and I was like, this is so stupid, I can't believe he's listening to this <laughs> That was a big thing in, in our little world. That was, it was a big thing because, you know, if you can't lose it, you can do whatever you want. What Christian wants to do whatever they want in terms of sin? What Christian wants the filth and the mire of the world? That's not what we want because our nature has changed. So it's not like we're, we're like, oh, man, I wish it was that so we could go back to a life of sin and still stay saved. No, we recognize it for what it is. It's bondage. It's disgusting. It repulses God, and it should repulse us the holier we become and the holier he makes us. All right, anyway. Any questions um, before we close? Yep. What was the verse in Matthew that you said about they will try to deceive them if possible? Oh, I think it's Matthew 24, 24. There's, he's saying there's going to be false, um, false Christs and, and false prophets, and they would deceive, if possible, even the elect. I'm going to try and find it again. I believe it was, is it Matthew 24, 24? Does anybody have it in front of them? Yeah. Yep, okay, good. Michael? Oh, I saw one more. Yeah, you kind of brought it up towards the end of the last little story, but as far as that passage goes where if a dog returns to his vomit and a sow returns after being washed, to wallow in the mire. Yeah. Um, I mean, the whole point of that is to show that the nature of the thing does the nature does the That's thing exactly thing. right. And so, I mean, the unregenerate yeah. person will do what an unregenerate person will do. Yeah, yeah. A dog, a dog returns to the vomit and a pig returns to the mire because it's the nature of the thing to do that. And we're saying our nature has been changed to a sheep and a sheep doesn't return to a dog's vomit because we're not dogs anymore. We don't return to the mire because we're not pigs anymore. That's exactly right. Yeah. Was that you? Yeah. 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 Right, because they, they, yeah, they say in the New Covenant it can't be broken and you can fall away from it. So I'm curious, if, yeah. if, would, they, I mean, if would they have a, 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 how would they describe that? For, for instance, they would have to separate the New Covenant from everything that you just Yeah. Said. So the question is about Pado baptists that, that say that the New Covenant people can fall away from the New Covenant because you're born into it, you're baptized into it, and yet you can fall away from that. And that's, it, it's a great point because they've got a mess on their hands. In fact, their whole federal vision debate, if you're up to speed on that at all, is rooted right there. There's, I mean, I've heard language from them of like, well, you can be temporarily elect. You can be in Christ and then lose it. There's a sort of union in Christ that you have. You're engraven on God's hand, but then you can be unengraved. It's just like it doesn't make any sense. This, Yeah. They should agree with us on everything with the substance and administration of the church. And like, yeah, they're part of the church, but they're not of the substance of the church. They're part of the invisible church, but not part of the, or sorry, they're part of the visible church, but not the invisible church. They'll agree with us on all that. But when it comes to the covenant, they can't say that these are promises of the new covenant 
the way that we can, the way that it says it right there in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So crystal clear that he's going to make it happen, make us stand firm, make us obey by putting the new spirit in us, which they'll say, well, okay, well, they're in the new covenant, but they don't have the blessing of the spirit. And it's just like they extend that, that substance administration part from the church to the actual covenant itself, not just the, co- not just the community, but the actual covenant itself. And that's their error. So, yeah, I think, I think they have a mess on their hands, and some of their language is wildly inconsistent. When they, I mean, I heard it in seminary even, and I was just like, you're going to tell someone that their child's name is engraven on the hand of God, but you don't know if that person is elect? You're, you're guaranteeing their salvation when you say that, and you cannot do that just because they're born into the covenant because you think they can fall away from the covenant. It's super frustrating. Yeah. 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 But they can't make that bridge. Yeah, they can't. You have these interesting buckets of even apostasy, right? You have apostasy from faith, but not for I mean, it's just they say they would they, they would have to say it like you get into the administration of the covenant by being born into it or professing faith. And then you get into the substance of the covenant. By having faith. So you get into the administration by profession or being born. You get into the substance by having actual faith. And we say, no, you get into the church by professing it and proving it. And then you get into the invisible church by having it. And those two, ideally, are going to be two very closely concentric circles, although we know people are going to fall away from the faith, fall away from the church, not the faith itself. And they just take that and they apply it to the actual covenant itself, as if the church is the covenant. And we're not. We're the visible covenant, community, but we're not the covenant. Yeah. Kind of building off of that, it seems like that uh, their view of the, the new covenant would necessitate some form of sitting the lazy right? If they're consistent, yeah. yeah they, they, they Arminianize Calvinism. That's what they do. If they're being consistent, which they're not, they don't. But the federal vision, that's what they do. We're Calvinists, uh, but you can fall away and break all this. So you, so you are Arminianized Calvinism. You are Arminianized covenant theology. And, yeah, it's ultimately semi-Pelagian. Totally agree. They don't like that when you say it, though. <laughs> For the record. Don't let that stop you. <laughs> all right, anything else? All right. We went a little long, but not too bad. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we have an assurance that is rooted 100% in your work, your promise, your guarantee, your love, your ability to keep us in the faith. We know that none of us are good enough to keep in the faith. We know that we're not good enough even to take up the the good blessings you offer and the means of grace and use those solely on our own to, to stay in the faith, Lord. It's because of your work. It's because the work of Christ can't be undone. An atonement can't be unatoned. All your work, all your gifts and blessings are irrevocable. And for that, we rest solely in Christ, knowing it's because of him and what you've done and that your love does not change. And because you don't, do not change, we are not destroyed. Thank you for an enduring love from you, an enduring faith that's been granted to us, the enduring gift of the Holy Spirit in us who will not leave us or abandon us, but will come and get us when we stray. Please return us to the shepherd every time we stray, and we will bless his holy name for this great salvation. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.